This is John Schlesinger speaking, and I am the director, or was the director, of Billy Liar, which was made yonks ago. Can't remember when. <laughs> Joseph Yanni was a wonderful producer. We made six films together. He had a commercials company, which he asked me to come and work for occasionally. And he said he wished he could discover me. I said, well, be my guest. I'd love to be discovered. And this was before my first film, A Kind of Loving. We did it together. It was a great success. And this was a, a famous journalist who occasionally introduced Housewife's Choice, which this is all about. And he couldn't pronounce his R's, so we put as many R's into the, the, the names that we could possibly think up. <laughs> I remember the audience at the premiere of the, of the film loved this sequence and they gave it a great round of applause. So we were very chuffed and happy. It was at the Warner Brothers Cinema in Leicester Square in London. I'd read the book of Billy Lyre some years before when I was directing Second Unit on a, a television series called The Four Just Men uh, with De Sica, which was a great um, thrill for me because I worshipped the ground he walked on. Great director. And uh, I said I'd love to do it, but the producer of the series who had bought an option on the book, just couldn't get it off the ground with me attached to it because I'd done nothing, um, and except a few documentaries for the BBC. So there was really no sort of backing for me. Um, and it was, the idea was dropped. And years later, when I came to do A Kind of Loving for Jerry Annie, which was our first film together, he suddenly said, I've got to the rights to Billy Liar. And so I said, oh, well, that's a terrific book. And it had been turned into a very successful play. And I said, I would love to do it. But I wasn't sure I wanted to go straight back to the north of England after my first film and do the same, not exactly the same sort of subject, because this was a fantasy as, as well as couched in reality but I decided yes I would do it and I've never regretted it so we started on that in Yorkshire which is where it's set really I did see the play rather depressed me I was looking for locations in the north of England and saw it in, in Leeds and thought this is awfully well done I hope I can do it justice. Anyhow, I hope we did, and uh, we we made it. My name is Tom Courtney, and about a million years ago, I was in the film uh, Billy Liar. It was a big day for us. I played Billy, we had won the war. and I'd previously played the part on the stage at the Cambridge Theatre in London. The fantasies were done very differently on the stage. There was one I was very fond of when Billy acted out having lost his legs. And it involved kneeling on a chair and sort of with one's legs folded under one. And, and it was very funny. And I rather miss doing that one. But these look quite sweet, don't they? <laughs> we, we, the play takes place entirely in his living room. I love the idea of the fantasy, doing, finding a way of showing it, with Tom in all the different parts, and Julie doing a perfect kind of queen mother act. And the rhythm of the whole thing intercut with the, the present day to the fantasy. We had to do this sequence in a terribly rapid time. I think we had one day to shoot it in. 
you know, in the screenplay, they've broken it up very well and taken it outside, you know, very naturally, I think. And John would have had an influence on that, that he wanted to make a film, not, you know, a, a recording of the, of the play. And I think he was right. It would have been easier for me to... I would have loved to have done some of the things I did on the stage, but I think it's much better for the film's sake to do it this way, John's way. Better for the film to see all these different locations and the parades and all these fantasies actually filmed rather than imagined. Because in the play, one simply entered down, down the stairs. I remember the first line. And he got the newspaper from the hall, from the letterbox in the front door. Cabinet change is imminent. Reading the headlines. Ah, and you'll be bloody imminent if you don't start getting up of a morning. Good morning, Meta. Good morning, Peter. It was quite difficult having to change, you know, having done it. The same with the dresser when I did that, that having done it on the stage. You know, you just sort of find different ways of doing it. Well, I might as well cut that for a start. If you've done a lot of performances, you sort of get set a bit. Today's a day for big decisions. John, go make him fresh tea for him. You've got enough to do without... Mona Washbourne, who was in the play, and Ethel Griffiths, the grandmother, were quite wonderful. We kept the people from the stage cast because they were so good. And, I mean, I can't think of any, anybody that would have been better than Ethel Griffiths, who, who lived in New York and had to be brought over from there. Ethel was a wonderful old actress. She used to take her teeth out specially to do the part. You know, she sort of acted it. She acted being old. Mona was in the play, Ethel was in the play, Wilfred Pickle wasn't. And I was terribly fond of uh, George A. Cooper, who'd been in the play, and I, I rather missed him, actually. Youth. <laughs> uh, Wilfred Pickles, I knew from when I was... Young, we used to listen to the radio at a famous radio show called, I think it was called Have a Go Joe. And so it was kind of fun to have him play my dad. I, I think we decided to pick Wilfred because there were a number of people that were, were right for the father, but he had this sort of rather sour faced snide reaction to his son. He wasn't the least encouraging. And uh, since the whole thing is also about this boy's rebellion against his family, uh, it, it seemed to me the right balance that Mona, with her kind of rather tired patience with the fantasies of, uh, of Billy, um, was a very good contrast to Wilfred Pickles. I was very fond of Mona. She was a wonderful pro. She had a lovely sense of timing and, and fun and a wonderful... You know, she was a very experienced and accomplished, accomplished actress and always a delight to work with. I used to do bits of Mona for my mother when she was ill because she never came to see me on the stage. I used to do bits from the play. Well, I saw the play on tour with Albert Finney, who'd had a great success in the play. But he was really too old to do the film, so we weren't contemplating him for the film. But Joey Annie was so uncertain of my abilities with actors, as I'd never shown any evidence that I was any good at directing them, that um, he gave me the test to direct of Tom Courtney long before he did the play of of uh, doing a scene from the film. And I knew, basically, that it was as much my test as his to see if I could direct actors and do it sufficiently quickly and all that kind of thing. And I knew that the cameraman, who was quite a well-known uh, cameraman, was being asked questions about my abilities. 
how, how was he to work with and that kind of thing. And then Joe showed the test, which wasn't that good, to various other members of the profession, directors, producers and so forth, to seek their opinion as to whether they thought I was capable of doing the movie. This is long before we did anything else. And uh, opinions seem to have supported me, thank goodness. So I went straight on to it after a kind of loving. I can't really remember, you know, the order of things precisely, but I think that Tom Courtney was associated with the whole project because he was cast in the play to take over from Albert, which is what happened. Albert Finney was the first person to play the part and the play became very successful. It was so successful that Albert could be replaced because he was going to leave, he, he left Billy Lyre to play Luther, John Osborne's Luther. And so somebody was going to get the job of taking over from him, and uh, it turned out to be me. Lindsay Anderson, uh, who directed the play, had seen me. My first job at the, at the Old Vic was playing the young man in The Seagull, and uh, he asked me to audition for, for him and the writers, Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall, and I did, and uh, I got the part. I remember that when I auditioned for them, I remember they were laughing a lot, so sensible chaps, obviously. Before I had any idea that I'd be taking over from Albert, I went to see the play twice. I thought it was wonderful. And of course, I, I, loved, I loved the play t to death. I'd never had such a good time in the theater. I was at the Old Vic at the time, and um, the contrast between what I was doing at the Old Vic, you know, I was in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One, Twelfth Night. You know, it was just lovely to see Billy Lyre and hear the audience laughing, more than they did at the Old Vic, I have to say. ...calendars to post last Christmas. All right, Billy boy, on your feet. I think it was pretty obvious that I was sort of good casting for the part. I was less physically imposing than Albert, perhaps more of a daydreamer. That's why John wanted me in the film. Because Albert's a friend of mine now, and we joke about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I got the part, and he didn't. <laughs> but uh, he d seems to have no bitterness at all. <laughs> the fact that he did, he did Tom Jones, which was hugely successful in New York, and, and Billy Lyre wasn't remotely successful there, not remotely. In fact, I remember being there, trying to do a bit of promotion for Billy Lyre. It was impossible. No one was interested. But they're more interested now. Strange, isn't it? Tom Courtney had such a wonderful innocence about him that was right for the part, as well as uh, enough considerable talent to make you believe that he was all these, these sort of roles that he was playing. I remember doing this scene outside Wormwood Scrubs Jail in London, which is quite ridiculous. And we cast this man with a hair lip who was the, the, the warder, let him out. And there, there, there is Wormwood Scrubs, and they've all got uh, copies of the book for him to sign. I've always been interested in, in the idea of fantasy and how one deals with it. And this was an ideal opportunity to show... Uh, to, to show the, uh, in direct cuts how the fantasy suddenly could work. Uh, also, there's the whole guilt of the fact that he'd stolen a lot of calendars from his undertaking firm for whom he worked and um, didn't know how to get rid of them. So there was a guilt trip associated with, the, with, with it. We didn't get this sequence right the first time we attempted to cut it. It took quite some time. <laughs> uh, and I encouraged Tom to invent as much stuff spontaneously as possible. I think the rhythm was very important to it the kind of 
attitude of the family who really weren't that interested in Tom's future and his, I think they've become used to his kind of rather far-fetched ambitions which they didn't believe he would go through with. Very important to choose a location that was above the town, below, so you could see the sort of distant factory chimneys and get the idea of the vistas and, and the way that he walked into town pretending he was blind or whatever. I had a very, very talented casting director called Miriam Brickman, who used to work out of the Royal Court Theatre. And she was associated, really, with the other group of people that um, formed free cinema, Tony Richardson, Lindsay Anderson, and so forth. I mean, it was the period where a lot of actors appeared on the scene who were from working-class backgrounds themselves, including Tom Courtney. And uh, there was something very right about them. They weren't typically well-known character faces that used to crop up in British films without fail. So they, they, were, they were reasonably fresh, and uh, I liked that very much. This is Rodney Bewes, who played Tom's best friend in the movie and also his workmate who was always pretty snide about Tom's truthfulness and so forth and uh, he has emerged in the last several years as quite a famous British player in television series and things like that this is a um, lovely performance by Leonard Rossiter, who was in my first film, Kind of Loving, and uh, he was very funny in the role. The character had this attitude of, we must modernise everything, including this. Tragically, Leonard Rossiter, who was extremely keen on exercise, he ran all the time had a heart attack on one run and died. He was in a series of films called Rising Damp, made for television, and uh, I didn't have the chance of working with him again after Billy Lyon, kind of loving, sadly. But he was very funny. George in his I liked because he had such a marvellous face which uh, had character to it. I was a few weeks out of drama school when Tony Richardson asked to see me. And somebody had seen me in my first job, which was The Seagull. Like John Osborne had seen me, and he said to Tony Richardson, he said, you know, if you're doing that film, the long-distance runner, you've got to use this boy. And that was just a few weeks of leaving drama school. So... I went to see Tony, and he did use me. It was a year or so later. I just instinctively knew he'd, you know, he would stick by what he said, but he wanted me to be in that film. So within a few weeks of leaving drama school, I knew I was going to play the leading part in an important film. It was nice to be discovered. And then also, in the meantime, I went into Billy Lyre, you see. So I was discovered twice. I was, you know, on the crest of the new wave. <laughs> you know, to be offered the leading part in an interesting film was, was wonderful. I wasn't going to say no. But as I did it, and then I did another one, and then I knew what I felt about the filming process. There was a point after a few years that I felt I had to make a conscious decision and do more theatre, or I wouldn't develop. You wouldn't learn much from just being in films. That's what I thought. Just the technical side of organising yourself, your body, how you talk, how you pick things up, how you do things. I, I felt I was a bit uh, raw, technically. I mean, in a film, you, you can get away with it, but 
I didn't want to get away with it. I wanted to learn to do things properly. You know, and I thought I'd have a longer career that way. I just didn't want to be a sort of new wave wonder, and that was it. I wanted to go on, you know, being an actor till I didn't want to be an actor anymore because I was too old, couldn't walk or something, or just fell over. <laughs> I remember on, on the set of Zhivago sitting, having my photo taken with Alec Guinness and Ralph Richardson, and I thought, this isn't right, I, I haven't done anything. I've done a couple of movies, you know. And they've done all this work, been in all these plays. And I felt an imposter, you know, having my name on the back of, of the chair, same as they had. Didn't think it was right. I don't remember t feeling that Tom was green, but it's an interesting thing that when, for instance, there are ways of cheating with actors, I sometimes start taking a scene before we're absolutely certain about it. In other words, the actor might say, well, may we rehearse it once more? I said, no, I'd like to start taking because they are not totally certain, and something wonderful can come out of that. If they don't know the lines perfectly, then they're grasping for them a bit. Sometimes you want to uh, have the spontaneity of trying to remember a line, and they, they, they can't, because you're only saying something one time, and, and often you don't want that to be too certain. So there's various techniques of when to go, how to go, you know, when you're starting to work. So inexperience doesn't matter to me. I was wondering if I could have a word with you uh, before you go... It's a question of how we could see the contents of the toilet um, convincingly without having to cut all the time. And... Uh, we talked about constructing the set where there would be sufficient space for us to get above it and shoot down so that you could see uh, the relationship between Tom as Billy trying to get rid of these um, calendars which he'd stolen. And uh, that worked quite well. I think I've used that idea subsequently. <laughs> I remember them fooling around with um, the coffins <laughs> on the set. And, and there was a, somebody, he was sort of an accountant on the film, and we hid one of the prop men in this coffin when it was standing up, and we asked the accountant, we say his name's Charles, oh, Charles, would you come and just sign this chit, please? And, oh, just lean it, put it up against the coffin. And he put it up against the coffin lid, and... We pushed the door aside with this little prop man who standing in the coffin pretending to be dead. And Charles nearly had a fit. Well, that's what I remember most, all this fooling around. Hello, darling. You have to have jokes on a film set, otherwise the days would be endless. Where are you taking me for coffee? Helen Fraser. Helen Fraser, again, was somebody I'd used in Kind of Loving. And... Um, I liked her quality, and she didn't seem to be acting too hard. I love the teeth, the sort of misshapen teeth that made her real, and the, and the sort of uh, the ch chin coming rather prominently forward. During this film, she fell head over heels in love with the with the sound recordist. And they married and had a huge family. And uh, recently we celebrated the anniversary of, I don't know which one it was, of Billy Lyon. And some of us all went back to Bradford to, for the unveiling of a plaque near where we had shot the undertakers. She came with her husband. Yeah, well, I was there recently, the Bradford Film Festival, promoting another film, and... Uh, that's when I heard how important it was to Bradford, and they, they had um, sort of special session, taking pictures of me with, to do with Billy Lyre. So they they, they like uh, accept it as as their very own, 
But I mean, it was, you know, it's a north of England town and absolutely suitable. I chose Bradford, or we did, because Joey Annie was very concerned about coming to all the locations when we were reviewing them. And we thought the mixture of new building taking place, which it was happening, and the the contours of the place, hill, very hilly, so that there, there would be shape to the scenes in the movie, was uh, was terribly important. And it was um, it was very effective. Bradford was associated very much with my earlier life because my best friend at school was a Yorkshireman and came from Bradford. And uh, I used to go and spend part of my holidays there. It's, again, a marvellous mixture of industrial and countryside. Uh, there are wonderful moors outside Bradford. Also, I'm associated with the north of England because my grandmother came from there, from Manchester. So I used to go there, and many of the short documentaries I made for the BBC were based around Manchester. It, it's a very splendid uh, landscape with the old factory chimneys and... Uh, which give it a sort of character of its own. And I, I like that a lot. Hello, this is Julie Christie. Um, when I was filming in Bradford, I obviously I didn't take much notice of my surroundings. I, I really was in a state of panic. Um, but every time I go back to Bradford, I think of it as representing that history of the northern counties, which is very different from the history of the southern counties. The northern counties, although Bradford was being knocked down in the film, in fact, they didn't get knocked down nearly as much as the southern counties. They just didn't have the money. They're poor, 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 the north. As a result, those cities, which are deemed to be you know, hideous and awful and, and grim, I love them because they still have all that architecture and all those buildings standing, which we've lost in the south. I love going to the north and seeing this evidence of great in British industrial power. I have no idea why people reacted strongly to that character I played. John had a very good piece of music behind my entrance, Richard Rodney Bennett, beautiful, beautiful piece of music, just perfect. He choreographed it beautifully with the uh, sort of bouncy sort of way that I did the, the walk into the city. But apart from that, what I think what I saw was a kind of charisma between my face and the screen. It's definitely very vital. There's a sort of energy in my face, and it's absolutely got nothing to do with acting whatsoever. It's a sort of magic thing, which is maybe what... You know, my whole career has been based on basically, which is that something happens when the camera looks at me, and I think this is true of many people who've become film stars. So I think that just it just might have been that, just might have been a little fizzle, you know, a fizz, not a fizzle, a fizz. You fizzle out, but you fizz, don't you? <laughs> yes, that's it. Um, so I think it might have been something completely non-specific um, and non-identifiable. This shot, by the way, was somewhere else. It wasn't in Bradford at all. It was in London and Tottenham Court Road where there were extensive uh, rebuilding going on. And the, the rebuilding was something that I wanted in the background all through this movie. We went out one day and did those shots of Julie with the building site activity behind her. We got out there and uh, timed it a number of times and, and could see when the ball was hitting the wall and how near it was to, to coming apart. So we just said, rush back and let's do it again, till we got it right. I knew the shots, the, the sort of shots I wanted. Was, and it's not, the, again, the first time I've used the idea of construction and reconstruction, which was very much a thing after the war that one noticed around. And so it was a kind of running thread of atmosphere, which I thought would help the movie. 
till we got back into Bradford with this opening of the supermarket, which is a scene I'm particularly fond of. Leslie Randall, lovely. He was a sort of comic, and I wanted to sort of exaggerate those qualities. And then something so ludicrous, like the all-girl Piper's band to celebrate the opening of the supermarket, which used to get a very big laugh. Oh, and the Dagnum Girl Pipers. It seemed something being opened in Bradford while we were shooting, and John said, oh, to Joe, can we hire them for a day, please? The film was very successful in England and maybe elsewhere, but certainly not in America. I remember at the Venice Film Festival, I was there when it opened, and again, the, the Italians didn't... Il Bilil Bugiardo. <laughs> they didn't seem to make much of it. I think there were too many English jokes for them. You know, the beginning with Godfrey Wynne on the news. They couldn't understand it at all. They didn't get them in those days, but now we, we know more about one another from country to country than we did. Well, no, I was very affected by the reaction in New York and at the Venice Film Festival, which is of considerable indifference. Considerable. And that, that's the mystery. So <laughs> when people tell me about these classic films, I just remember how they were received at the time. Though I think the film was popular in England, but... Not in America, and certainly not at the Venice Film Festival, where the Italians were completely mystified by it. Also, I think in America they thought it was a sort of cheap black and white version of Walter Mitty. It wasn't considered groundbreaking, shall we say. Journalists might describe it as, as that, but I don't think we, we did, John and I. I mean, I just thought of it as Billy Liar. Sorry, lad, no work today, he said. I think one of the things about Tom Courtney was that he was very adept at suddenly changing moods, you know, on camera, that you can see that an idea has struck him and that uh, whether it's a small thing as using the pencil suddenly as a cigar or being a blind man in the street and, or, or doing a music hall routine on the steps of uh, the cenotaph, or what was equivalent of the cenotaph uh, in Bradford, cenotaph being the war memorial. And uh, Tom was, was brilliant at that and thinking up things like this. And then when we came to this sequence, which is where he's imitating all sorts of things about Shadrach, the Leonard Rossiter role, and unaware that he's being overheard, we just let it rip. It took us all day to do, but uh, it was great fun. And it was a really vamp till ready situation. And we hit upon, you know, to, to, in order to shoot it with some sort of construction to it. You know, we said, well, this will take place there and then walk to there and then something else, etc., etc. So he knew that he had certain points of reference to partly improvise what we were doing. And it, it, it was lovely. I, I loved doing it. This sequence is represented in the book. I can't remember what uh, Keith Waterhouse wrote now, but... I think uh, Billy Liar works probably better for me than almost any other movie I've, I've made, and it's almost the oldest. It's, it can't be dated because it's, it's another era, and it's a beautiful picture of that era. And it still stays, for me, so funny. And Tom, I just, when he does that, all that improvisation, that Shadrach, Shadrach stuff, and then he picks up the vase and he sh booms down that. Oh, I, I just, uh, I'm just in heaven. And I think it's, it's absolutely perfect still. It's John's film, obviously. It's Keith Waterhouse's film, but it, oh boy, is it Tom's film. What a beautiful performance. Every, I've, I've only seen it twice. And each time I'm just bowled over by the 100%ness of his performance. 
Hi, Shadows! <laughs> He's just there a hundred percent all the time, putting his everything is working. His imagination is working. His body is working. His humour, his very humorous person, is working. It's a beautiful, beautiful performance. I get such joy from that. Uh, but he's a very good actor. I mean, he's just, he's a very, uh, very humorous, wry, self-deprecating actor, and it's always good to watch him. It, it, um, performing comedy is hard for me because I'm always scared stiff on... Um, film sets and and you've got to uh, you've got to be relaxed to do comedy you've just got to be relaxed and i think that the demands made of tom who is a comedic actor i mean he's also a serious actor um, but the demands made on him all those different uh, uh, roles that billy got into were what he would have loved because he was a, you know he was a proper actor he wanted to show off he wanted to show his stuff strut his stuff and he did <coughs> I, I love Leonard Rossiter. I've always loved Leonard Rossiter. I don't watch television, but I turn on the television series he was in. Oh, it's brilliant. He's so wonderful. You just want to eat him up. His performances are so gooey and gorgeous. So that's your ambition, is it? Script writing? Oh, yes, it always has been. You get a salary each week, then, or do you get paid by the joke? Well, we decided to shoot the film in widescreen, in cinemascope. So we could have the the little bubbles coming out of their heads and seeing what they were thinking, which wasn't as simple in those days as it subsequently became, because you needed extra people on the camera to control the focus and so forth. I, I might do something different now, because then you know we weren't special effects weren't things that. I was particularly interested in. Oh, oh, no. No, you see, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding. No, no, it wasn't... I didn't take very kindly to Cinemascope because it's very difficult to compose close-ups with so much wasted space either side. But um, there's more room on the film. And uh, I thought that using Cinemascope would be a possibility of having the thought bubble visualised. It's just an optical that you put in. Literally like a bubble in a cartoon. That's not what we're in business for. And then there's this other matter. Well, I suppose I was pretty green when I started making movies. I didn't know really how to tell a story in pictures uh, until it became second knowledge to me. You know, the, the, there's a technique which you only learn by experience. And I was lucky to have a very good operator, camera operator, on my first several films in the shape of John Harris, who taught me an awful lot about storytelling with the camera and how one uses the camera to make transitions because you don't want the end of sequences to go into another new sequence in the same way. You have to find different ways of doing it. This is uh, uh, the woman that I used in every film I made in Britain. Her name was Maggie Lacey, and she was a great enthusiast about filming. Any film, I found her working for the Bolting Brothers, and she similarly was in all their films. So I started to put her in all of mine, in little roles. And she was, she was funny, and uh, I liked working with her a lot. She's no longer with us. Well, now, as I was saying, Fisher, Anyhow, in the one needed book. to constantly have the audience in mind. How do you lead them to the next piece of information, if that's the aim of a transition? And it quite often is. So I think you have to think of the audience not to spoon-feed them, but um, they need leading through a story, and you've got to find ways of making that story constantly interesting. 
But quite often, it's the director that thinks of ways of linking sequences. I think looking at Midnight Cowboy now, it breaks all sorts of rules, and rules are there to be broken. It's also quite exciting to see the way one used cutting, you know, day, night, day, night, and more or less the same angle to show the passage of time. There's all sorts of techniques that one can do, and everything seems to me to have been tried once before. It's nothing is very new. But it's exciting, it's wonderful to tell a story with a moving camera. I do move the camera quite a lot. I saw some lovely stuff for the curtains. Honestly, Pet, you'll love it. It's sort of a, well, a turquoise, really, and it's got lovely little squiggles, sort of a, well, like wine glasses. Billy Lyre is photographed in black and white, which is something I've always liked more than colour. Though colour can be used very interestingly, which I learned later from making Far From the Madding Crowd, when the, the DP was Nicholas Rogue, who subsequently, of course, became a well-known director. But I had a designer on it called Richard MacDonald, who was enormously influential to me, and I learned a great deal from him. It's a learning process, you see. I never stop learning when I'm working. You learn not only about subjects which you didn't know anything about before, uh, but you learn technique until it becomes second nature, how to break down a scene. You know, it, it isn't the agony that it used to be for me when I seem to know very little. It's now endlessly exciting and fascinating. Then we'll go for a walk where it's quiet. Black and white leaves a good deal to the imagination, I think, which is why I've always liked it. Um, I saw a film the other day, A Girl on a Bridge, a French film, which I thought was remarkable in the way it looked, because one's just not used to seeing black and white films anymore, except in the old classical films. And one forgets that my first three or four films were all black and white. So when I came to learn about colour, it sometimes was a question of how can you make colour as black and white as possible? And that is a question of control of the colour of sets and costumes and things like that. And what amount of... Uh, influence you have on all of that. Of course, you have total influence. I remember when I came to make one of the films I made for Paramount, which might have been Marathon Man, and I wanted it to be as black and white as possible, and using a film of Bertolucci's as an example of colour being used almost as black and white. The Conformist, and I showed that to the entire crew with particular reference to clothes and set dressing and uh, all that kind of thing, uh, and lighting. And I'd love to go back and make a black and white film, but I know it's there's so much fight against it. But there are occasions when you really have to fight to realise something, that you have a gut feeling that this is a film you really want to make and that, that there is a film in it, though other people may not think so. I felt that the cutting from reality to fantasy uh, immediately, without any apology or explanation, was the way to do it. It's what jumped into his mind either, you know, as a direct cut or, in this instance, with a, a kind of dissolve and uh, rather more leisurely. Music is the most exciting part, almost, of finishing a movie, waiting for the new addition, 
which is going to change the nature of the film, as music will do. And Richard Rodney Bennett, who wrote the score for Billy Lyre, as well as several other movies I did, a remarkably talented man. Are you feeling all right? I'm personally very fond of graveyards. I think they make wonderful locations. Contours, you see, they're lovely contours. Steps up that show you the shape of graves and things in the background. You know you're making me ill, don't you? Helen Fraser was very sweet. I was very fond of Helen. She hadn't been in the play. I didn't, I didn't know her before, but she was a very sweet girl. And, uh, I mean, they're good scenes, aren't they, when he wants to make up to her and she eats her oranges. She gets annoyed. Remember on the stage, the oranges would go all over the place. Finally, we, we had to play in this huge theatre in Streatham Hill, and I threw an orange and missed it. It was supposed to land in the armchair and it missed and it went on and on and on downstage for miles. We started giggling. <laughs> I've come about a ring. Oh, yes. An engagement ring. We're yes. brought in for alteration. Oh, I see. What name is it, madam? We brought it in, so it should be under Fisher. Fisher, just a moment. Oh, the film is about a, a t very specific moment when Britain changed from post-war Britain into modern Britain. But the youth hadn't been recognised as a market at all, so there was no fashion. There was no designers who designed for youth because youth weren't meant to have money. They weren't autonomous. You know, Billy in this film is not an autonomous person. He is completely overruled and imprisoned and trapped by the will of his parents. So what? how women dress was, they, girls, they dressed like their mothers, minus the hats, because their mothers were still wearing hats. Um, but I think you can see it very clearly in, in, in the film with the two opposite ends of the female spectrum, uh, discounting Liz. Uh, both of them would have, would have been dressed like older people, not, not like younger people. You don't mean you've been telling me lies. Well, not lies exactly. Now, I can't say this film is great on women. It's, at this point, it's still a man's world. You've got the bitch, the virgin, and the real woman, who's a fantasy. But that's fairly um, representative of that time, I think. Of course, in his, in his next film, Darling, if it was his next film, John went on to deal more with a, a woman's role in this changing world. How many other lies have you been telling me? Philip Larkin, the, the British poet, wrote, uh, Sexual intercourse began in 1963 between the end of the Chatterley Ban and the Beatles' first LP. So... That's where Billy was. The film is full of, of evidence of all those changing things. A supermarket, which was not ordinary, which was fantastic. It was like opening a cathedral. The beginning of that kind of consumerism, all the, all the working-class ladies shouting and screaming because they were so excited by the idea that there was going to be this emporium of goods where they could consume. And, of course, there was the arts. The arts began to be where uh, what working-class people saw as... Um, a way out, whereas previously they had always stayed in the place they were born. They stayed with the family, near the family they were born. They did nine to five jobs. Suddenly there was a possibility that you could follow that sort of artistic inclination and get out. And um, actually it's got some things, this film, in common with Billy Elliot, the, the other British film that's just come out, um, with the child of the working class who has is an artist and has to fight against the um, hostility of, the, of his milieu. That, and, now, and that's all those years later, it's still the same. Oh, well. The thing that interests me about Billy is the way it's seen in that particular time. I know that now he would be seen as a victim. And I don't think there, with that particular outlook, he was seen as a victim. That's what interests me about this particular portrayal. I mean, you couldn't be in a more hopeless home. <laughs> his granny would drive anybody up the wall. I mean, maybe, he's, he's, certainly his mum loves him, his father's a terrible bully. Dreadful. And the boy has sensitivity. He is artistic, and nobody gives him a second of the day. Not a second. There is not a second of trying to understand who that young man is, and I guess it's been like that since he was a, a baby boy. It was just, it's just to do with conforming to your parents' lives. And um, 
No wonder he turns into a dreadful liar. I've often dealt with anti-heroes in my films, and you've got to find something that people can identify with, and if they're out-and-out shits, they won't necessarily engage the audience's sympathy. Now, I don't mean by that that you've got to sentimentalise film or character, because I don't think you do have to, but I, I thought it was necessary to make Billy a sympathetic character. And therefore one liked the, the eccentricities and the feeble attempts at being funny. Well, Gwendolyn Watts could have been a very kind of obvious caricature, and I, I think we've avoided that. I think she was really skillful and was... In, in just going far enough and not completely over the top. Because, of course, the love interest and the, 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 the sort of muddle that he gets into proposing to several people at once, etc., is, uh, is, is very charming, and, but, but I suppose could have seemed awfully difficult and stuck in. One with me. I want that ring back and I want it tonight. Oh, well, uh, that's just it. I've got to stay in tonight to play Monopoly with my Uncle Ernest. Uh... I don't know why I've never been associated with more uh, comedy because I love comedy and particularly if it springs out of character and I've never been far away from it even in serious films but I haven't really often made what's laughingly known as a feel-good movie. It's usually feel bad movies, I think. And it wasn't until much more recently that I became associated with the, with the sort of lighter kind of comedy like Co Comfort Farm, which was a film I made for the BBC, which got a very large theatrical distribution in America and, and seemed to work. I never thought it would appeal to an American cinema audience, but it did, so... I was very happy about that because I've always believed in the big screen, not the small one. I don't know that people were worried about me as director of something that was essentially comic, but had a serious underpinning to it. It wasn't a, a farce with, uh, which could make people laugh through sight gags. It's a character piece, and I've always chosen to make character pieces, whether it be, you know, a thriller or something that's comic or whatever, and this fell into that category, I thought. So I wasn't... Well, I'm always worried when I make a film, particularly that's different, and um, you question whether you're going to bring it off, Yes. That shirt's clean. I'll clean shirt him in a minute and so his grandmother back like that. Him and know what? Him and his fountain pens and bloody suede shoes. If he wants to go to London, he can bloody well go. Oh, but he's not. I tell you, I've finished with him, he can go. Oh, but he's not. I tell you, he can pack his things and get going. Oh, but he's not, Jeffrey. I'm telling you, he's not. Look, I can explain all of this. Yes, it's ever since... This is the part of the film where it ceases to be quite so humorous. And this is where... Uh, the, the sort of sickness and death uh, section of the movie. And the grandmother has had a heart attack. And I, I wondered how to do this scene. And then I remember the day my grandmother uh, died and the noise that she was making. Um, the moaning and stuff. I know it sounds terribly callous, but um, it was a sort of sound that affected me for a long time. And I thought, well, I'll use it. And we did. When I first read the novel, I realised that what it was about was principally this boy's need for... A healthy fantasy life to get him through 
the difficulties that he found with his family and with his surroundings in the life that um, he was leading. That's what I responded to in the book because I believe it's enormously true. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who know that the risk is important to take but haven't the courage to take whatever risk that is to fulfil or help advance their dreams because they just haven't the courage to do so. And I think that's an absolute truth about people, humanity. And I think as long as you realise that, then life perhaps becomes easier. I think there are books that may not transmit the film. There are a lot of, a lot of subjects which have an internal conversation going on with oneself and that I think those might be difficult, not always, but quite often, to, to turn into movie material. I think you need a story, and a good story is a basis for a film. And what is the story that you're telling, and why do you want to tell it? These are all questions that any filmmaker has to ask. And I would never be much good at making a kind of intellectual kind of film because that's not the way I respond to material. I don't think one has to have lots of reasons for always doing everything. I mean, in Cole Comfort Farm, you know, what was the nasty thing that she saw in the woodshed? You never have it explained. It's neither explained in the book nor do we in the film. And we debated whether we ought to have something to show for that, to try and fill in the audience's curiosity, but I knew it would be wrong to have done so. I always read a book and say, oh, I know how to do this fairly soon if I'm thinking of it as a film. And usually one's first impressions are the last impressions. That's something I've learned from doing television because you have to be awfully quick in deciding how you're going to treat something. And it's what's interesting. Once you've said, I think this could be a movie, and not every film I've attempted, the script has not always turned out filmable, and I've abandoned it, or they've abandoned it at the front office as being too expensive or whatever. And you think, just as well, I didn't do that. Well, that was a process shot. They were taken to the local football match and we just used them as plates. I was told it would have to be back projection or a process shot, which I hated the idea of. I still don't like it much, but it, it works. I wasn't even very keen to use the possible techniques that are available to, even then, to studio shooting. Now, if, you know, it's half of the course. I think that looking at Billy Lyre again, uh, nowadays one could use much more process for the fantasies, which would have been interesting to do. Um, but I was a documentary filmmaker from that school and realism was all important. So I objected strongly to trying to do it with back projection in the studio. Of course, it's a perfectly legitimate way of working. And there was Finlay Curry, of course. And it seemed extraordinary. There was this man who'd been in all these films. And he was very, he had a sort of aura around him, very august. And one felt one had to be respectful. You didn't give any acting lessons or anything like that. Not that I can remember. But, I mean, he did be been more than welcome to. He just went about it and very dignified. Very old. Very old. But still there. I mean, he's still a massive presence. And, and he, was, he was in his 90s. And, of course, that to me seemed awfully old. Now I'm in my 60s. It doesn't seem quite so old, really. <laughs> Finlay Curry, who's a wonderful actor, and I remember strongly seeing him in uh, 
great expectations. But this is many years later, and he arrived just a few days before we started work with him in a rather sad state because he told us that he'd just lost his last surviving daughter and he wanted to know what the schedule was so that he would be able to get there for the funeral and this preoccupied him somewhat and he had great difficulty remembering his lines. We were very preoccupied with getting him through it even to the extent of trying to pretend he wasn't playing an undertaker and removing all signs of the hearse, etc., outside the exterior shots of the business. But he became very charming to work with and uh, knew that he was giving us some trouble. And we were sympathetic to this. And then he, at dinner, he wanted to regale us with all his stories of touring around America originally in the theatre, <laughs> which was a very charming reminiscence. But there he was. I'm glad I had the opportunity to work with him. We said, who, who would be physically right for this role? And uh, Miriam Brickman came up with the idea, and I loved the idea because I'd always admired him so much. And... Being a director is, is sometimes fun because you can realise the sort of fantasy of working with somebody who you, you particularly admire. or You're always waiting for the part that's right for the particular person. And this seemed to be the, the right sort of part for him. And so we went ahead. when he's standing on the edge of a cliff or whatever it is, throwing the calendars out into the wind. We couldn't have done that anywhere else except somewhere on the Yorkshire Moors. And it's nice. And then you can get much longer shots and silhouette shots and things like that, which I certainly like a great deal. One does it now, not simply for the look, but for the economics because it's so expensive to build a set. When I think of the sets that we built for a film like Marathon Man, which were colossal sets in Paramount, and wonderful they were. Oh, you can't afford that easily now. But to be forced because of economics, of to go inside little rooms where it's difficult enough to get far back enough to get a medium long shot telling the geography of the place is, is also sometimes a problem. So I'm torn between building sets which gives you much more freedom and you can take walls out and you're not hemmed in as you are on a location interior. On the other hand, Sometimes the limitations dictated by the choice of interior force you to shoot in a certain way, which is quite interesting. And, and here you are, eh? <laughs> well, so, so you want to be a scriptwriter, eh, uh, Billy? Uh, yeah. well, it's a great line. I couldn't swear to it that he's going to make a success of his life in London, but I don't think he's totally without imagination. That's the key thing, that he has imagination and he has ideas. And that, I think, marks out the possibility that he, he might go somewhere if he had the uh, strength of will to just do it, to go to try and get the opportunity. And I think I'm sure a lot of people who want to go into show business have thought it's too big an effort and given it up or, or not pursued it relentlessly which I believe you have to do. Of course, I think Billy was an artist. I think he did have talent. It's only that he was so, uh, such a frightened person that he wouldn't have known how to organize anything. It had to all sort of retreat into his dreams. 
and he was in a very belligerent atmosphere. I mean, that father would almost be seen as uh, almost abusive nowadays, I think, in, in the fact he just took no notice of Billy at all. But I like the way John didn't judge, that he observed, he, and he does that a lot, he observes without judging. I think that's... Uh, I think one of the great things about him is that he sees life with affection and humour. That is his great talent. I mean, you think of that wonderful film, Midnight Cowboy. And there's no value judgments in that. I didn't know we'd, anybody else would have dealt with those two terrible creatures. Uh, I mean, they, they are in his pantheon of characters who are damaged and yet have a sort of immense sweetness that comes out of their innocence. Billy's really very innocent. Julie, who tested for us twice, and we, we still turned her down, uh, I think I must have been crackers to stick to my guns the way I did because I saw Liz as a rather big-titted, ample, earth mother figure. And that wasn't Julie. And the physical side of it influenced me so considerably that I turned Julie down, as well as my own sister, who was one of the candidates, we went for somebody who physically we thought was right, Topsy Jane, her name, and she started the film off and she just became very kind of out of it. She was sick and we didn't quite know what was wrong with her and she clearly was not in good shape. And I, I said to Joe Yanni, um, I think we've got to make a change. I think we've made a terrible mistake. And we've concentrated on the physical side and not enough on the kind of emotional qualities that Julie had. So we've made a deal to pay Topsy off and Julie came in, very nervous girl, who had done a bit but not anything substantial. And she came in and we had to reshoot everything we'd shot on this character. Anyhow, Julie took over, and, and the funny thing is that once you've made the change, the nervousness that accompanied the initial decision, you see in perspective, and everything went fine after that, and one didn't think any more about it. Though, of course, it's a ruthless business that we're in, and the person that's affected is someone that you've actually um, had to replace. And... I'm not really a ruthless enough person to not be affected by that. And sometimes, you know, if you don't make the change, one will regret it forever because the film will never really be right. Twisterella. Don't know where Twisterella... Who wrote it? It's my song, Lee Nava wrote it. Honestly? Your words of music by Fisher and Crabtree. We gave it to them months ago. They never said we were going to play it tonight. Did you really write it? Of course I did. Isn't it great? No, I have a feeling that this man, who was both in Kind of Loving in the dance sequence and in this, he was the band, a local band leader, and uh, he might have had something to do with Twisterella. But I can't remember exactly... This was all process stuff because Julie was... We were reshooting this sequence. We went back and we staged this in the dance hall, which we'd done it originally, and just matted in the long shots of the ballroom that we'd used before. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. We did the sound of the grenade going off and uh, and you don't see it happening. So we used all sorts of techniques in this rebellious fellow who wants to get rid of people. I was very, very thrilled to have got the part because it meant I was part of the new wave and the new wave occurred just after I left drama school where we, we were all taught to speak in, in a very elocution manner and our uh, you didn't have many people who came from the provinces or who had accents. And if they did, they had it bashed right out of them. So 
It was a, it was a sort of social revolution where it was the new England. It was the England where, for instance, there was access to university for the first time for working class uh, boys and girls. It was going from a conservative government into a socialist Labour government. Uh, oh, there were so many things changing. And along with that, of course, came a recognition of the powers of the working class, the sort of existence of the working class. And, and they're very, very conscientious young people making film who felt they'd had enough of uh, all this uh, concern with the upper classes and the privileged. And above all, it all started, of course, with the writers. Our writer, Keith Waterhouse, and uh, there were lots of other writers who were working-class boys. They were boys. It was not a lot to do with uh, women, this change. And um, they started to write about their lives, which, of course, people didn't know a lot about unless they were working-class. So suddenly a new reality burst into people's lives. So the filmmakers who were responsible and wanted to do something different and were serious got hold of these books and stories and started to make films about them. Free cinema was very much the baby of those directors who made up the Royal Court Theatre at that time, like Tony Richardson, who formed Woodfall with John Osborne and, um, and Lindsay Anderson, and to a certain extent Carol Rice, who was part of free cinema, but not part of those group of theatre directors at that time. But... I remember that they resented terribly the fact that I took Miriam Brickman as a casting director as if I was trying to poach on their preserves, and they were furious about that. And I thought, very silly. So we weren't all bosom chums. I was ploughing my own furrow, and luckily I found, or was found, by Joe Yanni, who was an extraordinary producer. I felt there was no great feeling of brotherhood in the British film industry uh, as far as directors was concerned. I felt that much more strongly in America, that one's part of a group and everybody knows the difficulties of making movies and there is a kind of brotherhood fighting theoretically, if not actually, you know, the problems of front office and the studio or whatever. I'll never forget when we were auditioning and, and Julie Christie walked into the room, this extraordinary face, which I gawked at, as I was sort of gobsmacked by this extraordinary face that walked in. And then I just looked over and, and John was... Well, he was sort of grinning. My expression of wonderment. <laughs> Sweet. Mm. I became better friends with Tom on Dr. Zhivago. I was in uh, Billy Liar for such a small time, and I was t too frightened, probably, to be able to make friends with anyone. But on Dr. Zhivago, we were on it a long, long time, and I think we were the only English people, and uh, Tom's very English, so... I think we found a sort of uh, companionship in having known each other and being English and, and being able to be extremely snobbish about being in a big Hollywood film. <laughs> At the time I got the part of Liz, I, I didn't want to go into films. Um, women were all very, very glamorous in films. You know, they came out of the Amazon with their hair absolutely immaculate. And they were wonderful, but it didn't appeal to me. And I was only interested in the theatre. However, John eschewed glamour, as you can see, and it was part of that cinematic revolution at the time that glamour was put aside and that they were going to deal with reality. It was, it was a sort of neo-neorealism. And I was so proud to be in a film like that. I had been in a couple of films before, a couple of comedies that were very sort of amusing, <laughs> very typical of British comedy. But my ambition was to be in one of these uh, new wave films, which were dealing for the very first time with a working class and uh, with real social issues. And, uh, I, you know, there's no reason 
why these things you wish would happen do happen. But anyway, it did happen. My ambition came true. And I was so proud to be in a film where I didn't have to look old-fashioned, which is how I saw glamour then. I saw glamour as old-fashioned. It was uh, filmmakers daring to present a reality instead of a fantasy, although Liz, of course, is a fantasy. And I sometimes wonder if I was the first young female actor who, who played that kind of part, who didn't have her hair combed and set and uh, sprayed and who didn't wear beautiful clothes. I mean, my clothes were just... I mean, you can't even describe them. They were so incredibly ordinary. So I, I'm proud of that. It's certainly looking back that I represented something that hadn't been represented before, which was naturalism, I suppose. Perhaps you could call it the first appearance of grunge. Only this was uh, completely unselfconscious, uh, and, and uh, you know, grunge is a fashion. I think that in terms of fashion, Liz, in the more sophisticated surroundings, might have been a beat. And I think that's probably what she became when she went up to London, sitting in coffee houses with, uh, you know, black stockings, men's sweaters, um, playing chess, listening to jazz, discussing the meaning of life with artists and musicians, and smoking dope. That's what I think Liz started to get into when she went to London. I and mean, then she would have lived the life that I led, probably. What I very soon was able to see, you know, watching John's career, was how absolutely wonderful he was on the intimate and the banal. For me, his best films are his most intimate films and the ones that are dealing in the way he does with great affection and great humour with the peculiarities of human beings in, in very small situations, non-dramatic, non-theatrical, just tiny little ordinary situations. I think the reason that we chose Julie when we looked at the tests again and said we were mad not to cast her in the first place, is that she has such a, a wonderful screen quality, which is indefinable. Why does she work? There's something about her face, her mouth, which isn't typically pretty. She's got a wonderful face, terrific eyes. She was a frightened girl at the time, and, and later too, when I did Darling with her and Madding Crowd. But she has a wonderful cinematic quality, which is you want to watch her. And there's a spontaneity about her, which, if you can catch it, is just lovely. And the swinging handbag entrance, which a lot of people remarked on, was a very good entrance for her into this movie and into movies in general, because it was such a lovely sequence. Julie has a kind of fresh, spontaneous quality, which was right for Billy Lyre because she had a free and easy style. And that was, that's what caught the audience, I'm sure. I don't know how I deal with actors from different backgrounds, except that they're actors, and every actor needs handling in a different way. Tom had already done the part in the theatre and in the test that I did. But that wasn't so difficult. I think that if one had asked Julie to improvise that scene when he's wandering around making those funny impressions of uh, Leonard Rossiter, I think she might have been a bit lost. Uh, I think, in other words, Julie needed more specific direction that you have to approach everybody differently to see how you can crack that nut to get into the kernel. It's endlessly fascinating. That's why, you know, I think I'm good at directing actors because I am I know their problems. I was an actor at one time, not a good one. And I, I've subsequently acted in a couple of movies and I'm not very happy doing it or comfortable. But... Um, I think rather than being dogmatic about how to play a scene, I think you, you've got to give them their head, let them lead, and then see what they're giving you and then shape it and correct it accordingly. Perhaps it's too much and you want to bring it down. And I remember saying to Laurence Olivier, who was not always 
on the money and sometimes it was way over the top and I had to find a way of telling a great actor like him how to cut it down. I said, I wonder if you could make it a little more intimate, Larry. And he knew what I meant immediately. He said, you mean cut off the ham fat? And I said, well, yes, that too. So you've got to find a kind of code for how to communicate with an actor. I mean, every actor needs direction, even Laurence Olivier, because sometimes he was so over the top that it was embarrassing. There, down at the infirmary. Oh, your mother and your grandmother, who the hell do you think? I think if directors have been actors, as John had, you know, they have a better notion of how difficult it can sometimes be. And they would probably tend to be uh, sympathetic. But I think directors, to, to get the best out of actors, have to be on their side. You, know, you can't bully them and shove them around like so many naughty children. You've got to obviously be sensitive to their requirements. The part was sort of made for me. My northern background, my working class background, you know, there's the scholarship boy that Billy was, you know, he won a place to a grammar school in the same exam that I took to get to a grammar school. Uh, Billy's parents were better off than mine, but there was still, there would be lower middle class, mine were working class. But that, that difference was only marginal. I don't think Billy's parents were as sympathetic as mine were. Let me say that. I'm telling you, don't walk there. I'm just about fed up with you, with your hiding and your meddling ways and all of that. The main difference between me and Albert, I think, I think with Albert, you, you really would have wondered like mad why he didn't go to London. Whereas I think with me, you had a sense that perhaps he wasn't going to go. You know, just because Albert's sort of more physically imposing than, you know, he's broader than me in the chest. But Albert, I, when I saw Albert, I thought he was quite wonderful on the stage. One of the best performances I've ever seen. So it was quite something to have to take over from him. The first night, I remember, it was before it was awful agony, but once I started doing it and the audience were laughing, I was fine. God give me strength. Strength, he wants to give you some sense. There was so much of it that was to do with my life in the north of England, in Harlem, the longing to go to London and make something of myself so I could identify with Billy. Utterly, totally. Some of the play was so close to home that I could barely get the words out. It was when Billy has a speech about how he won his scholarship, you know, as I did, and his father was worried about how much they'd have to pay for the uniform at the grammar school, and that speech I simply couldn't get it out. In fact, Albert came to see me one matinee when he was in Luther. And he said, uh, oh, the grateful speech. I said, yeah. He said, uh, you're having a bit of trouble with it. Yeah, that's right. I said, yeah. He said, you're going to have to do something about that, aren't you? <laughs> but what I did do, I can't remember. In fact, it, it took me weeks of playing the part before I could manage to get the speech out. So full did it make me. The challenge was taking over from Albert, who was very powerful and successful, and I wasn't a very experienced actor, so there was that. You know, and become more adept in a very long part. That did suit me very well. And then the, the film, the challenge of the film was, was keeping the life of, of the part in, in very different circumstances. So I think the challenges were technical more than more than anything else just coping with filming filming is very much with dealing with yourself and with the day as much as it is to do with acting that's why some less good actors are more successful in films you know some of the very best actors have not done their best work on film and uh, some actors who haven't got any best work <laughs> manage very well in films <laughs> You know, it, it, acting in films can be very much of how to deal with a long day. And whether you try your best on this take or are you going to have another ten takes. I used to hate it when I was young and they said, oh, I think we'll go one more time. Oh, no, I used to think, don't want to do it anymore, that's it. But 
you know, the camera shook or somebody knocked a lamp over, you know. I used to get very fussed about all that, but I, I wouldn't so much now. It's frightening in a play, before the play starts, that's scary. But of course, once you get on, you're the audience. And if you know reasonably what you're doing, you'll get a strength from the audience. If you don't know what you're doing, then you will have a ghastly time. But if you're well enough rehearsed and have a nice part, the audience will great help. Learn from the audience how to do the part. You don't get that assistance in film. Well, I think you see in the cinema, you've only got to get a scene once. That's why children can be more easily directed in film than they can in the theatre. It's not a question of working with the actors so that they can drive the car out every day and it's running the way you want it to run, which is what you do in the theatre. You're working from a text and you've got to somehow find a way of getting actors to solve the problems as if they've thought of it themselves, which is one secret, and yet to keep it fresh. I'm only daunted by difficult actors or actors who have an alcoholic or drug problem. I don't really know how to approach them. Luckily, I've had awfully few of those kinds of people to deal with. I've had to deal with it, but it's not comfortable and it's not easy. Grandma died at seven minutes past eleven. I just love Mona Washbourne's performance now. I find it quite wonderful. They're dealing with that dreadful British uptightness and repression of emotion. It's so uh, touching. And what I love is what John did. Granny's just died. Mona is obviously in a, in a state of marvellous repressed pain. And... Um, Oh, she did that scene beautifully. Tom is embarrassed, as as young people used to be. I mean, above all, they, they, there's a pain in there which they don't recognise and they're embarrassed to feel the pain, don't know what to do, what's the right thing to do, someone's died. It's my granny. I actually happen to love her very much, but uh, the whole thing stays, you know, painful throughout that particular scene. I won't catch it. You haven't got any money. Can't afford it. No, this is where we rather altered this style of the film. It's a long scene and we held it very still. You know, it's painful for Mona Washbourne, his mother, in the film. And, and I just wanted it to be a st static, still scene so that one can watch the players. For us to be able to sit and listen to what she was saying and watch or watch her watch it she was feeling. It's about the one intimate scene between Billy and his mother. And the rest of the film has a kind of snap to it in the rhythm of the cutting. I'm sorry about the grandma. We shot this the day before Christmas Eve that year. And uh, when we finished it, everybody went off for Christmas. I think this movie has appeal because people can identify with the character of Billy Lyre. It can take place in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of different uniforms and situations, like when he's going through a kind of war zone and looking at it. And I've had several films that I wanted to make, which is all about fantasy when they haven't seen the light of day yet. I say yet because I'm still hopeful, because I love fantasy. I'm not interested really in elaborate special effects and things like that. I don't care about that. I'm interested in the, the human effect of people in the movies. The inventor of penicillin and radium, we of this proud... It was um, the time of the collapse of the old Conservative Party, and with it, those conservative values that had held for so long. 
Of course, what happened very soon after this was that the regions themselves came up with their own culture. I mean, you think of the the Liverpool beat. That was Liverpool, it wasn't London. That's the Beatles and and many others. And so what I'm hoping is that Billy became part of a regional cultural uprising in his own... (laughs) in his own spot, even though he didn't make the brave choice. He's just too scared. But because he had talent, I, uh, maybe the, the choice came to him. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. Another couple of years, he'd be writing his pop songs and uh, getting them played by really good bands. And there, it was the beginning of something else. It was that time was the beginning of travelling and travelling about, going to London, escape. People didn't travel to cities. I mean, even I, when I was... um, I lived in the country, and when I was, let's see, what would I have been about, 1920? Sometimes my boyfriend and I would take the train up to London, and it was a fantastically big thing to do. We'd go to... We always went to the same jazz club, or cellar, and uh, it was fantastic, it was wonderful. We'd stay the night and not tell anybody, because we lied. In those days, you had to... It was a big thing. Now everybody goes to London all the time. In London, if you haven't been to London, you're you you know hardly alive. And now they all go to America too. <laughs> this film is not a big story or anything. It's uh, in fact it's not a story. From that lovely book, which is not a story, it's about a description of a time, a class, a place. And then there's nothing big in it, actually. It's all sort of based around this one thing, which is the choice. The choice a young person gets, which will determine their future, which is crucial. And that's all it's about. It could almost be called the choice. And um, Billy makes his choice, and uh, it possibly isn't the most glamorous choice. (laughs) Britain, then was at a very um, specific point of change. Harold Wilson, who came in next year, the Socialist Prime Minister, a Labour Prime Minister, was talking about taking Britain into the white heat of technology. What he was talking about was taking it away from industrially-based country into a modern country, a modern progressive country, all of which happened, and then we got the swinging 60s. So... Tom's choice was to go into this new thing which nobody knew about, but which was presenting itself. And, uh, and of course, he chose not to, because it's frightening. I think it is frightening. I think the, the aspect of freedom that was, that was being offered, and he was being very specifically offered by Liz, freedom, free love, uh, reverse in gender roles, um, where the women were proactive and not passive, um, was all very alarming. Liz is a fantasy because she's the writer's fantasy. I mean, that is what he fantasizes about a woman like that quite clearly. And a woman like that might, it's very unlikely she'd want to marry Billy. I think that's where the fantasy comes in. It's the old male fantasy where the male who is lacking in a whole load of things fantasizes that someone who isn't and who has all the things he wants in a woman actually wants him. That's the fantasy bit. It's not so much Liz is a fantasy but that he should be so strong in her life, evident in her life, is a fantasy. That's classic, isn't it? I think we all are amazed at some friend's attachment. I mean, we we can't understand what they see in them. And um, there is something sympathetic about Tom Courtney and, and touching and the need for support and friendship and... Um, I think that that's got a nice quality to it. And I understand why she does it. I've never questioned it. Would you like me to get you a drink? I think it's very laborious sometimes in film to s- explain everything. Say this, this she does because she finds him sympathetic or charming or whatever it is. Even the, his own fecklessness is quite attractive. Because I'm not a supporter of having to explain cause and effect in plots. When it came to the crunch, Billy was 
happier in his fantasy world. You know, at the end of the film, you didn't feel strong enough to try and make this uh, fantasy world more real. And perhaps there's something dreamlike about the girl. She's not very real. She's part of his fantasy too. Nothing real about her. And there's something unreal about Billy's, Billy's relationship with her, and that's why he doesn't follow her to London. There's no connection with them, really. She's a sort of fantasy girl, not a real one. I, I tend to feel it might have been better had he gone. I, I think he probably was a clever boy. But maybe he just didn't have the drive that it takes. Obviously, that's how the, <clears throat> the writers must have felt, and that's how they had it. You know, the people have talent, and people have drive, and sometimes the people who have talent don't have enough drive. A shame that he didn't go. I remember a friend of mine saying, why, why didn't he go to London? I mean, Keith uh, Waterhouse went to London, and Willis Hall went to London, and I did. Why not Billy? It's a mystery. Well, I think that this is a character who lives by his fantasies, and they get him through the difficult parts of his life. And when he can't face the courage that is necessary for him to f follow Liz and go to London, he resorts to his fantasy. Uh, and there's the invisible army to protect him, marching up the street to his home. And he goes into his home alone, and there's the national anthem of Ambrosia playing away. And I think that's, that's right. I think that the cowboy, and Midnight Cowboy, learns that perhaps this life that he's chosen isn't profitable or isn't even accurate. And I think he comes to the realization that because he says so, I'm not really cut out for this. But the fantasy of his life has provided him with an escape route. I don't think that Billy is any the worst for resorting to needing and believing in his fantasy to get him through life. I think quite a lot of us do that. That's the way I lead my life. I think it's a personal thought, the need for fantasy, the need for beauty and romance, as Nathaniel West wrote about Day of the Locust. And, and that's why I think I've chosen the sort of subjects I've chosen, which are about people living on the edge, outside perhaps whatever is considered the normal thing to do. And I've always believed in the necessity of, of fantasy. And that's why I suppose I choose those subjects. <laughs> 